Thank you so much, Natalia and Ashley, for inviting me today. This is really great. I'm so excited. And thank you, everybody who's joining us from all over the world. This is a really great opportunity to share something that is near and dear to my heart and that I work on every day. And it's such a thrill to see all of you getting interested in it as well. So I'm Christy Shine. I am an emergency medicine physician. I work in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the US in a hospital uh, called Thomas Jefferson University. And I work as the director of research in the health design lab at Thomas Jefferson, as well as working now as the director of scholarly inquiry academic programs as well at the medical school. So lots of wonderful work that I get to do every day, looking at um, problems in healthcare and how to solve them. Thanks so much. Great, it looks like we've got you up here. Perfect, okay. And if we can just advance, awesome. So um, in the world of health design, we often think of empathy as being the driving force behind our designs. And my story into design is not any different. So uh, this is my younger brother here, Timothy. Um, and Tim and I uh, grew up together, sometimes at odds and sometimes best friends. Um, and I have to tell you, my brother is a remarkable individual because he faced um, a handicap challenge his entire life. And that is a hearing deficit. Um, from the time he was young, he has had less than 50% of his natural hearing, and he can't actually hear some frequencies at all, which make it really difficult for him to interact um, and have normal conversations. And he really had a lot of struggles as a child to learn to speak um, in a way that other people can understand um, and to hear the world around him, to do education, all of the things that we don't even think about doing most of the time. Um, and so as my brother was younger, there was a lot of talk about this technology called a cochlear implant and what that was. And that is a device that can help uh, individuals with hearing problems to, um, to to be able to hear the outside world around them. Now it's not natural hearing, it's a supplemental hearing, um, but it does in some ways take the place of your native hearing. So if you have some hearing, um, they were really hesitant at that time to use it. But from a young age, I was really exposed to this idea that medical devices can be used and be, can be used on people to help them to interact with their world and overcome their medical deficits. And I thought that was a really interesting and unique thing um, and kind of stuck with me both my brother's struggles and then the idea that you can actually go ahead and design things to do something about it. And so um, in addition to empathy, most paths in uh, design also involve some creativity and some experience. And I think by default, a willingness to kind of put yourself out there and um, at the risk of embarrassing yourself. And so these are some more embarrassing photos that kind of take you through the path of um, who I am and where I've been. And so um, I've always had this kind of very creative side to me. I was involved in theater for a number of years and thought maybe that's where my life would take me. Um, but at the same time, really love science and really love this idea of medicine and prosthetics and devices to kind of help support people. And so um, I actually ended up doing a PhD before I did uh, medical training and um, in that PhD studied in particular bioengineering and so learned how to design medical devices. Um, Fortunately, I had the experience during my graduate studies to do um, some health training at a medical school and um, really fell in love with the clinic. And this, I think, is what really changed the game for me as an engineer and designer, which was being able to interact with and be around patients and to really see who and what you were designing for in a way that you simply couldn't do if you were harbored away in a lab somewhere. And so I really think um, having these multiple aspects of my life have really led me now to where I am in my position in the health design lab um, where I can kind of you know explore and use this creativity as well as these engineering and medicine concepts and bring those together with information from my patients to kind of change uh, the way we view health and challenges within it. 
So our goals for the webinar today are first to basically recognize that there are these design fails that occur every day all around us in healthcare and to flip it and look at those fails as opportunities for us to grow and change the world around us. Second, I would love to introduce you to how we go about designing for better health in the health design lab with our health design thinking approach and really to discuss that framework as an opportunity to solve problems. And then finally throughout, I'll be giving some some examples of some work that we've done to hopefully help inspire some of what you're doing as well. And so some of you have probably, hopefully most of you have seen this picture by now. Thank you to um, Katie Bowman. This is of course a black hole. Um, black hole is a region of space that has a gravitational field that's so intense that nothing can escape from it. Um, colloquially, we think of this as a place where things disappear without a trace. So you might be wondering, that's great astrophysics knowledge, but what's that doing in our talk today? And what it's doing here is this. I think healthcare really is the black hole of design. It's something we talk about um, in our laboratory. It's something that we see every day on, uh, in our ER, in our clinics, in our OR, ORs. There's just so much about the field um, that leaves us with a taste for the fact that things could be done differently and done better. And if we can advance one more. And so if you don't believe me, let's take a look around the emergency department where I work. And so this is a fax machine, right? This is an antiquated piece of equipment that we use almost nowhere else, but we still use it in healthcare. And sometimes in the middle of the night, I will get a very sick patient dropped off from a local um, nursing home or another medical facility or even sometimes from a home and I'll have no information about that patient and this is the best that I can do in the middle of the night and that I think is a little bit of a tragedy and we should try a little bit harder. This is another huge design fail that happens in the emergency department is the patient gown. Now take patients who are showing up who are in pain, they're sick, they're tired, they've been waiting for hours potentially in the waiting room, and now you ask them to put on this super complicated piece of uh, clothing that has buttons in some spots, it has snaps in others, it has twist ties and other ties in the back, um, and this simply becomes complicated. And what happens is the patient just puts it on over their clothing, um, and that can uh, severely limit my ability to kind of see what's going on with that individual. This schematic is just to show you a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes in medicine. So if I want to admit my patient um, to a particular service or place, I have to go through a rather complicated um, algorithm to figure out who and, and where I admit that patient to. And obviously, as you can see, this probably results in a lot of extra phone calls, a lot of phone calls to people in the middle of the night who don't need them. Um, and I think it's something we can do a little bit better. This is a picture from our trauma bay in the emergency department. And I just wanna point out that this is actually our uh, oral thermometer and our rectal thermometer. Unfortunately, when you look at them, they look strikingly similar and you really don't wanna put the wrong one in the wrong place. And so there's a tiny difference between them. And if you can see, it's just on the right side of the screen, there's a little red dot at the top. Um, and that little dot is the only thing that separates which is which. And so if we go to the next slide, you can see the hack that we did in our emergency department, which is we hacked red is for rectal. And we've had, with this simple innovation, a really great compliance with use of our equipment um, just by making this simple little hack that wasn't thought of by the original designers. There's other fails in health design. So for example, if the computer system is down and you're trying to get a consultant information about a patient with a fracture, the only way you might be able to do that is actually texting them with a picture with your cell phone. And you can imagine this isn't the greatest thing to do for privacy, but if a patient needs emergency surgery, you can clearly see why we would want to do this um, if we had no other option. And finally, this, this we all have seen before, this is a bedpan. Um, and the bedpan in the emergency department becomes a hack for many, many other things. And this is what we're doing in the ER all the time is we're hacking things. Um, and so when we have patients who come in, 
who are occupying maybe the space we would normally use for our pelvic exams. Um, unfortunately, uh, we need to hack a pelvic exam for a patient on a regular pelvic bed, a non-pelvic bed. And so if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see what that looks like. And what we do is effectively, we use the bedpan to put under the patient to be able to do a pelvic exam. And that's not great for me as the provider. Um, it feels very hacked, it feels not professional. And for the patient, it can also feel very uncomfortable at a time when they're already feeling vulnerable. And so this is actually a project that we worked on within our own hospital to see if we can create a better solution. And so um, while healthcare may be, you know, the black hole of design, uh, what's really exciting is we have the potential in health design to really change healthcare from the inside out, to use the insights that we gain from our providers, our doctors, our nurses, our technicians, our patients, our caregivers who are with the patients. We really all have a unique perspective about what's going on in the health environment, and that perspective is really valid and can help us to make far better designs. So I work in the Health Design Lab at Thomas Jefferson University, and the Health Design Lab is really a creative educational and maker space that exists in the site of the former Federal Reserve building in Philadelphia. And what's so wonderful about our site is unlike when this space was occupied with gold in the 18 and 1900s, it's now occupied with knowledge. And instead of kind of closing that off into the vault, it's something that we leave our door open permanently so we can share that knowledge. And part of that, uh, idea of sharing knowledge is why I'm here today to talk about our strategies of how we design for better health. Um, and now no great health design project happens in isolation and involves a lot of wonderful collaborators. And so these are um, some of the people who are leading the work in the health design lab. Bon Ku and Robert Puglisi are individuals who um, started the health design lab a few years ago and started really with the idea of trying to change how we educate medical students um, so that we can all look at the problems in the world around us and kind of design toward better solutions and healthcare. Bon is the uh, Dean of Innovation for uh, the Sydney Kimmel Medical College and Rob is also the Director of Innovation for the Jefferson Enterprise and uh, they're wonderful resources and a lot of what you'll see here today is their work. Um, Jeff Hayden is my other uh, colleague in the emergency department and also colleague in the Health Design Lab and Jeff is a remarkable individual who has done so much in our lab to uh, change how we teach medical students and to develop new curricula to enable students who don't naturally have a background in design to become more comfortable with te techniques in design, concepts in design thinking, and then uh, to be able to go out and then use those concepts to change the clinical uh, realm around them. So um, all of this work that you'll see today is a combined effort of all the individuals listed. So beyond just the four of us in the lab, um, we have a number of other people we work with. We work with um, product development firms, we work with medical students, industrial design students, occupational therapists, the list goes on and on. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do this without the really unique environment we have at Jefferson where we have both uh, an engineering and design program as well as a medical school. And again, um, really our focus here is to not just create medical devices, but to create a new way of thinking for physicians and healthcare providers, one that's more patient and human-centered and more creative to create better um, solutions for the future. So at the Health Design Lab, in addition to creating uh, our future doctors, we uh, work on creating medical devices, as I mentioned. We also um, have a program in 3D and bioprinting to help us to help our colleagues in surgery for pre-surgical planning. And we also do some work with uh, local community organizations to actually take the work that we do in our laboratory and using a mobile trailer platform, bring that out into the community to design better health uh, from the, the residents of the community themselves working with them. 
So let's now um, start to talk about health design thinking, what it is, the mindset that we use in our lab, what principles it's based on, um, to give you guys an idea of how you might work through a particular problem that you see in medicine, such as the one that was posed today. And so health design thinking really is an open mindset rather than a rigid methodology. It starts with the needs and desires of people rather than with a business proposition or a market opportunity or artistic idea. It involves observation, conversations, research, and collaborations. And that's generally something that people in medicine tend to be good at. Um, but really what excites me is that it also enables you to use the other side of your brain. And so I think you don't have to be a doctor. You can be the person who is more creative, who wants to learn about the medical side, or the person who is uh, medical, who wants to just kind of flex those creative muscles a little bit more. Um, and so there's the main principles that we use in health design thinking are that everything we do is human centered. It's based on empathy, this idea of co-creation, which I'll talk about a little bit more, and then also incorporate some social determinants of health as well. In terms of the creative mindset, it's really favoring an open-ended exploration rather than a straight path toward a given outcome. And it's a creative process that involves asking questions, visualizing thoughts, creating some tangible prototypes, and then telling stories about people and ideas and the outcomes that can come from um, our new uh, ideas and products generated. So the methods that we use in health design thinking are kind of this very easy observe, imagine, make kind of protocol. And what's important to notice about the diagram that I put up here is that it's not a straight line and neither is the design process. So here um, you want to observe by uh, looking, listening, asking questions and, and gathering research. Um, you want to then imagine uh, multiple ideas, how to sort those ideas into groups, how to create relationships and analogies between them. And then finally move into this maker space. And that's really that where that creative mindset comes in, where we create prototypes of all sorts that help us to really see how our product would or process would look or feel or be experienced by the person we're designing it for. I'm gonna take you through the steps a little bit to show you how we approach a problem. And so our first um, section is observation. And again, you don't have to do these necessarily in the same order, but in the observation area, we're really looking to discover what our patient or our provider's pain points are. So for example, if you're a patient with diabetes, what is it that uh, confuses you? What is it that frustrates you? What is it that really um, changes your ability to interact in a way that's productive and, um, and feels like you're cared for by your provider. And then we wanna take those pain points that we learn from kind of these open-ended conversations with patients and then look for opportunities among them to find really what are the points that we can intervene on? What are the things that um, excite us and that would make us wanna work all night? What are the things that um, would delight our end user or our patient? And so part of that is actually getting to know your patient. And we work with patients all the time in the health design lab and not just um, hearing their stories, but actually understanding a little bit about their life. And so maybe if it's a patient with an assistive device or a wheelchair, we might try to understand a little bit more. What is it like to get strapped into that? How does it move? What does it feel like? And what does that patient uh, actually experience in the moments that they're interacting with their medical devices? Um, another way that we can gain empathy during the observation process is to actually experience a little bit more. So not just hearing what the patient has to say, not just observing kind of their medical equipment, but actually experiencing it ourselves. And so we did a recent workshop um, where the question here was how might we de um, develop better products for patients with diabetes. And now this was for a group of designers and people in marketing who wanted to create better advertisements and products for these patients. But when we asked at the beginning of our workshop, how many people in this room have diabetes? The answer was none. No one in there had diabetes. Um, and, th and that may be common, but certainly everybody in the room seemed to know someone who had um, this health condition. And so what we did to gain empathy throughout our workshop on teaching them about health design was to actually 
falsely diagnosed them with diabetes for the day. So we handed out glucometers to everyone in the room. We gave them food log sheets. We told them, we gave them instructions and said, you now have diabetes, experience what this feels like. And so throughout the day, they checked their blood sugar, they kept track of all of their carbs, and we didn't necessarily feed them the most um, uh, appropriate foods associated with that. Um, we then had them get up and use the bathroom once an hour or more, just the same, all of the same struggles you would feel. And really um, what we realized by doing these very interactive uh, workshops is, although it sounds counterintuitive, wait, someone's gonna have a great time pricking their finger all day long, the answer was yes, because all of the people in the workshop agreed. They finally understood just a small component of what it was like to be a person living with this disease. So much like this challenge has its own how, how might we statement, we often create how might we's to guide how we work in the health design lab. And so one of our recent um, design projects that we did was with a medical packaging company where our challenge was how could we improve the medical packaging process. And here are how might we was how might we improve a central venous catheter tray organization for providers so that it's both intuitive and waste free. And here central venous catheters are um, somewhat like a large IV that's used for very critical patients. And so this can provide multiple life-saving medicines at the same time. But as you can imagine, it's a very large kit that has lots of different um, pieces of equipment in it. And is something that is usually used in a critical moment when a patient is very ill and perhaps even dying. So um, the next phase for us is to move beyond just kind of taking all of that information that we gathered from empathy and really trying to generate new ideas on um, on that to really understand now that we know what the patient goes through or the provider goes through, how can we create a better product for them? And we use a technique of brainstorming. So brainstorming um, traditionally for us is a group creative activity. What makes our brainstorms a little bit different is that idea of co-creation. So we like to brainstorm with our patients, with our providers as part of our medical team so that we can gain firsthand insights for generating um, spontaneous new ideas. And so our brainstorming sessions um, look a little bit different than some you may have seen before. They're inherently kind of messy. They're a little bit over caffeinated at times, um, but they really involve bringing everyone around the same table um, without the traditional barrier. So we might not have our name badges. We might not have our, our clinical white coats on. Um, and it makes it really hard to distinguish, wait a minute, who's the patient, who's the doctor, who's the engineer, who's the nurse, who's the designer. Um, but that itself is by design because we want everyone to feel like their ideas are valid and that there's no hierarchy and that they are themselves an expert in some part of this process and that everyone can feel free to not only use their own expertise, but to actually have the opportunity to listen to and gain expertise and uh, knowledge from the other people at the table around them. So generally we do provide some brainstorming rules um, and this might be helpful for you and your groups. Um, so some of the things uh, we talk about is having generally one conversation at a time in our brainstorming sessions. Um, that way you can build on the ideas that other people in your group have uh, come up with. We generally go for things that are um, kind of headlining ideas, wild ideas. We wanna stay on the topic, but we don't wanna discourage um, any individual idea, we don't want to judge. We want all possible ideas because often we find that um, some of our greatest ideas come out of sessions where things got a little bit uh, interesting and unique and we were able to build upon some ideas that maybe didn't initially seem super uh, connected to a topic but allowed us to really um, get out of our initial thought process and kind of go out of the box in our thinking. And um, one of the things we'll talk about later is constraints. And one constraint we often do in brainstorming is to, uh, to constrain. So we'll have the idea of once you sort of get to the point, usually two or three minutes in where people start to run out of ideas, you just throw in a constraint. It might be something like, hey, now all of our ideas have to cost a million dollars or involve kittens or whatever it is you may be. Um, but those things can actually really help to drive new creativity. And so I just wanted to point out that constraints don't have to be something that limits you. It can be something that actually opens you up to new experience. 
So going back to our central venar catheter example, um, we asked the question, how might we make it uh, intuitive and waste free? And so you can see this is just an example of kind of some of the ideas we came up with are things that we wanted to reduce waste. We wanted to make uh, our syringes easier to hold. We wanted to have better labels for the kits. Um, we wanted to be able to easily identify any missing components and prevent those components from getting dropped or lost or, or broken in terms of their sterility in the process. And while that all looks very nice when we publish it in our book, the truth is brainstorming is actually pretty messy and that's okay. Um, the process of brainstorming is one where um, it's not refined. There can be duplicates. Uh, sketches are a wonderful technique as our symbols to kind of stoke our creativity. And here during brainstorming, you really want to go for quantity of ideas because you can tease out the quality in your next steps um, as you start sorting ideas into groups. But having uh, just a large um, collection of ideas is really important because you can start to seek relationships and analogies between those and, and move on to your next ideas. So the most fun part and what we love doing in the lab, of course, is prototyping some of our ideas. And prototypes don't have to be something that's fancy. And this is really important to point out, particularly in web webinars like this, because you don't need a health design lab to make an effective prototype. What you need is just a little bit of creativity and some basic supplies around you. Um, so for example, you might use a sketch to create your basic idea that's the lowest of fidelity prototypes, but maybe you take that sketch further and you make several sketches that talk about a storyboard of, of where um, that product or process is going to go and head and how it's going to affect a patient. You can do other things. You can make low fidelity prototypes out of building blocks, out of children's toys. Um, if you want to make an app, for example, you don't have to have any kind of knowledge of how to physically design um, uh, the app itself. But we can, you can do is take cardboard and a sliding piece of paper and you'd be able to pretty much see how that app would, would feel and operate in a patient's or person's hand. Um, you can also do skits. It's a wonderful way of being physical, acting out your idea and realizing very quickly what would work and not work in a clinical environment. And often what we do in the health design lab is we try to stoke this creativity a little bit more by um, giving our, our students some uh, fun tools to work with to build initial prototypes. And so here you see, this is all a collection of, of toys that we got, most of which came from a dollar store. So uh, health design thinking doesn't have to be done on a huge grand scale of budgets with 3D printers. You can do it easily with 10 items or less from the dollar store and some post-its and some, you know, some tape. What's important about your prototype is it just has to have a fidelity that's high enough to get you the information that you need in your design process. So these are some of my colleagues that I'm poking fun of a little bit here, going back to my theater roots. But here, um, Bon and Rob are having a conversation. And if you're mocking up that conversation and you're trying to understand what would this play we're going to design or this process feel like for someone, um, you can see that when they have no props in their hand, it's kind of really difficult to figure out, well, what are they talking about? Are they paying attention? What's going on? But the more you give them tiny props, the more you see suddenly it kind of looks and feels enough like the real environment that you can figure out, oh, okay, I know what they're trying to portray and I know what's going on here. It's the same thing when you're making a product uh, prototype. Um, sometimes a sketch is enough, but other times you may want something that can even just fold flat or fold open like a device. You may want color and other um, elements that would excite the user in a higher fidelity prototype, or you just might want to put it in the right environment where um, individuals can kind of use and test the product and really feel like what it would feel like for them to give you some feedback. So these are some of the prototypes from recent work that we've done. Um, going back to our central venous catheter uh, tray example, um, these are some of the prototypes that were created by the groups here. And what you can see is um, there was lots of different ideas that were generated by those brainstorming sessions. For example, there was a group who made a tray um, that had multiple levels that would pull off so that each section, um, all of your prep work pulled off, all of your, um, your actual catheter placement devices were in the same layer. And then when you pulled that off, then all, all of your final 
cleanup, suturing, putting it in place, all of that was there. Other groups focused on ideas of waste and on um, making the product safer for patients. And so you can see there's um, uh, one of the examples has little waste trays built in. And then finally, another prototype that we had was um, completely going outside the box. So instead of having a package that's square that people take things out of, what if instead we had a roll where you just open the kit and it rolled up and you can connect it to the IV pole and everything you would need to do that procedure would be in the appropriate order and would be at the fingertips of the provider who's um, putting in that device. Um, in the next side, you can see is a prototype we made for a project looking um, to try to treat um, patients better with sepsis. So sepsis is any kind of life-threatening um, uh, infection that's occurring in the emergency department um, that has uh, a distinct protocol based on our medical knowledge, things like we want to give the patients fluids, antibiotics, we want to take certain labs, um, we want to make sure we're figuring out what type of bacteria it is. And uh, these things all have to happen very fast. And unfortunately, sometimes in the clinical world, there's lots of patients, lots of competing things. And so um, it's easy to miss a step. And so this group came up with a really simple solution of this sticker that goes on a patient's bed with sepsis. And every time you do one of the main uh, tasks for sepsis, that sticker gets peeled off. And you can see you very easily can go from stopping uh, what you're doing because you're not ready to send the patient to the ICU versus um, that clear go sign, that green that lets you know, okay, now we've done all the appropriate steps. Now the patient's ready to go on to the next step of their care. And finally, you can also use um, role playing as a means to get a lot of feedback. So it really, role playing, what it does is it embodies a service or a process in a way that's social and physical. So you might, for example, still have some cue cards like the group on the one side here that shows you, um, that's kind of highlighting who's who and what's going on and they're all pretending to be um, little videos that would occur on a screen for a patient. Or you can do something that's a little more interactive. For example, um, this is uh, our resident health design sprint this year. And we had a group who was trying to design better ways to, for medical students to be involved in teaching in the emergency department. And so they created this kind of super suit for medical students to involve them in the care of patients. But what you can see is you can really figure out pretty easily, would this be too bulky? Would this not be too bulky? Would this be something a medical student can handle doing? Is this something that's too distracting? Um, and you kind of get all, at all of those answers pretty quickly and you can have a great time doing it too. And then going back to um, a little bit of the concept of constraints. So we mentioned earlier in the talk that constraints are something that we can use to um, expand what we do, but constraints are also something that we can use to help guide and kind of bring our idea into a more uh, feasible place. And so in health design, we do have to worry a little bit about um, different uh, aspects of a project that we create. Um, so one thing we have to consider is desirability itself and understanding that often in health design, we're designing for a particular end user. So for example, we're going to design for a particular patient that has osteoporosis to prevent a fracture, or we're going to design for the clinician. But what we have to understand is that those different end users may have a um, a different idea of what is desirable to them in a final product. So um, things we need to consider then are um, can, uh, is who will use a product? Um, is it the doctor that we're really designing for? Is it the patient? Can we adequately through co-design uh, design for both? And then um, additionally, who's going to buy that product? Is it the patient directly buying it? Is it an insurance company? Is it a hospital system that's buying it? And who makes those decisions? And how could that person's input happen early in the design process such that we can uh, be confident that this won't be a barrier to this wonderful product getting to market? Um, we also have to think about how a product could be sold or marketed to some extent. Um, there are wonderful products, but if we can't get them out there to where people see it, um, that can also be a problem. So generally, um, we're just thinking about really in health design, the concept that there are multiple end users that we're designing for. So while we want to be human centered, we also want to be kind of social centered and understand the idea that that, that uh, person exists within the context of a much 
greater healthcare system. And we need to be sure that we're not creating our products in such a way that, that would limit its applicability um, simply because we haven't considered a particular um, input or end user in that. So really in innovation, it's all about that sweet spot um, that kind of occurs right between what's desirable, viable, and feasible. And so I just wanna run through one quick example um, and then we'll get to some questions from the group. This is just an example um, going back to what we showed you about the design fails earlier. Um, where we talked about the um, unfortunate issue of bedside public exams in the ER. And uh, if we can skip one more slide, this is a product that we came up with um, to solve the problem of um, what's going on uh, with this bedside public exam. So here um, we have one public room in the emergency department. Um, you can argue the design fail of the window itself, uh, but just trying to show you that if we have one bed that's specially ready to do this, but unfortunately we have a patient in there because we just had someone come in critical and we didn't have enough beds, now we have to improvise. So now we want to do all of our steps that we talked about earlier. So first we wanna observe, we wanna see what are people doing now in the emergency department and, and how are we doing that? And then um, kind of come up with that, how might we redesign the bedside public exam question uh, such that it's both convenient and dignified. And so um, going through our observe and imagine and make and kind of all of these steps kind of coming together in this photo, um, what we're doing is we're having a, a young woman, a student who's kind of up talking about this is what it feels like to be having a public exam and to be having it in a place like the emergency department. We have designers, engineers, other people involved who are going through this process. We have one of the men on the design team who's actually posing as the patient and feeling, what does this feel like? Because that person's never actually had this exam and realized what vulnerability is associated with kind of that position and the device. And then having other individuals maybe practice, what does it feel like to be in medicine being the provider doing this device um, and making this and, and giving this kind of exam. Um, you'll see our imagine and our make. Um, we go through all kinds of prototypes. There's all kinds of post-its all around showing our ideas. And then finally, we're moving toward our final product, which we created, which was called Tilt, and the company is called Gia. And here, this is a device that basically functions to create any bed, at, to turn any bed into a public exam bed. And it's something that's comfortable for patients. It's something that's easy for providers. It's something that folds under the bed and doesn't take up room in the emergency room setting. It's easily wiped down. And so we're talking to the environmental services people, the provider, the patient, and all of these come together to create a product that everyone will be able to like and, and be happy with at the end of the day. So that's it in terms of my general talk about how the Health Design Lab um, approaches these health design problems and how we use health design thinking to um, create better health for patients. If you'd like to learn more, please um, follow us on social media and take a look at our website. Um, and I'm happy uh, to answer any questions you may have now. Thank you so much uh, for that, Christy. We, we Appreciate your share. And those are such great case studies. Um, really excited that everyone got to learn from those really tangible examples. Um, so we had folks share a couple of questions ahead of time, and then we'll also try and weave in the questions that you've been sharing through chat. Thank you so much. Um, if you have more questions, keep adding them and we might be putting something together for everybody um, after this. Um, but the first question we wanted to ask you was how healthcare design changing and maybe what innovations you're seeing emerging that might inform the future? Yeah, so I mean, I think healthcare itself, um, like a lot of industries, is constantly changing. And certainly, we're seeing in healthcare right now a, uh, a change where we're getting more technologies into our healthcare environment. So one thing we see is the use of electronic medical records to bring a lot of information about patients together. We're also seeing more um, prototyping going on. So we're providing surgeons and other individuals with models and 3D printed devices that we didn't do before. So I think you are seeing that we're integrating a lot of uh, new technologies. And one um, important thing with that, of course, to think about as a designer is that to never get too sold on any one particular technology. And so one thing that we do in the Health Design Lab is we try to, um, to recognize all of these 
technologies that are there, understand them, know about them. We do use a few of them ourselves, but we try to keep things generic and really sort of understand that to develop a really great idea or product or prototype doesn't necessarily take the technology itself. It just takes creating a prototype of it that's similar enough that you can kind of role play and see how something would form. So I think we're seeing a lot of these changes um, in the, the use of technology in healthcare, but I think um, it's not something that a little creativity and design can't overcome. I love that it's both the, the mindsets that are changing and then some of those emerging technologies too. Um, another question we had was, do you have any ideas for how folks um, on this chat or in the challenge can build empathy for people older adults living with osteoporosis um, who have broken a bone? Yeah. That are so, in your condition. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think one, one way to build empathy certainly is to um, try to understand and talk to people who have this condition. Not everyone in their life, of course, is going to have an older adult that they can talk to about what their experience with broking, breaking a bone was like, but a lot of people have broken a bone. A lot of people have a friend or a, a loved one who has um, themselves. So even kind of using that surrogate and talking to that person about what your experience was like, you might also find a similar thing. So maybe you don't know an older individual who has um, osteoporosis, but maybe you know an older individual that has some trouble with walking or ambulance in some other way, you might ask them, what is it like to use a cane? What is it like to incorporate a walker into your life? And so you'll start to see like these are devices that patients who have fractures and are going through the healing process will need to use. And so you can kind of start to get um, some ideas of, of uh, what it's like to be to be them and what it's like to go through that healing process. So I definitely, we recommend, again, things are human-centered and when it can't be totally human-centered and exactly what you're looking for, just add that little creative bit and look for something close. Yeah, those analogous inspirations. Um, we also heard a couple of times in the forum uh, before this webinar, a curiosity around how to design something that isn't asking too much, especially of older adults or people that are already dealing with their, their conditions. So. Do you have any thoughts or tips on designing um, interventions that, that aren't asking too much of folks that they're trying to help? Yeah, so I think, again, the first thing is kind of know your end user, right? Like understand who that person is, how they think, what they're comfortable with and what they're not. Um, so for example, younger folks are super comfortable with apps, right? We use them all the time. We get rides places, we order food. We do most of our things now on apps. Um, but if you're an older adult and you don't have a smartphone, that's a totally foreign place to you. And so I think remembering um, who your end user is and that they may have uh, different uh, strengths and weaknesses versus someone else. Um, but also understanding that even if they're not using an app, they're smart people, right? And that they do have a lot of knowledge and experience and a lot of information to share with you. Um, so I think in general, we always kind of recommend in our lab that when you're thinking about ideas, kind of really think about um, the least amount of technology you need first for that particular idea. Um, it's really easy to scale up technology and make things more complicated, but I think the most beautiful and uh, the most wonderful designs are those that are inherently very simple and can be applied to large groups of people. Simplicity first. Um, we also had some questions around um, approaching medical staff if you want feedback um, or want to prototype something with them. Um, how do you make conversations about human-centered design and something that you're excited about feel um, worthwhile and accessible, or if there's a proxy for that? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things we like to do is when we do our initial brainstorming sessions and we're um, talking to patients uh, or to providers, we like to involve them, like I mentioned in the that kind of co-creation process, um, because that's really taking them on the journey with you. I think it's really hard to talk to someone in isolation and ask them, um, you know, what is it like to have this condition? And, and they feel very vulnerable that they've shared all this information with you. And if you kind of walk away and say, okay, now that's the end of our relationship, um, it, can be, it can feel kind of um, isolating for them. But I think if you involve them throughout the design process, and remember that the design process is iterative and it's constantly coming back on itself, that um, they'll have great insights to share as you go. So 
often, even before you have a prototype, you may mention a, an idea to a patient. Um, you may bring them a small early prototype and you might think, oh, geez, I don't know about this prototype, if they're gonna get it or not, but bring it to them, show it to them. It'll help you figure out like what level of fidelity do you need? Um, and will also help you figure out like, oh, maybe there's some design flaw that I have here that um, I didn't know about. So I think, um, just kind of going back to our message earlier, that idea of involving your um, your patients or your end users throughout the process. So it's not, uh, when it comes time for feedback, you don't have to find a new group of people. You already have a group of people who's really invested already in what you're doing. And they're invested, of course, in their disease and solving their that problem. And so I think you're gonna find those people are gonna be really interested and excited because they see that they've also helped to develop that. And I think there's that kind of like pride that goes along with it um, that really can be a great co-creative driving force for um, getting these ideas into a place where we can use them. And a way to honor their their time and contributions too, yes. to keep involved. Yeah, I love that. Um, just a couple more questions here before we wrap for the hour. Um, but we've got some interest in, you know, wanting to contribute to health design, um, but not having a medical background and sort of how can someone get started on this or other topics? Like what's a great way to, to start getting involved in health design or to tackle a health issue through design? Yeah, so, well, I think this webinar is a great opportunity and um, certainly finding ways to get involved in forums that are um, publicly available and easily uh, accessed by people all over the world, I think is a great, uh, is a great option. I think um, you can also get in help involved in health design in small ways. Certainly, um, there's a lot of people who write in the design space, um, not necessarily for healthcare. We are, uh, as an organization, putting out a book. Bonku is publishing um, it within the next year, which um, is kind of a great resource. And we see that as kind of our secret sauce, if you will, of what we do in the lab kind of out there for other people. Um, and certainly always collaborate with other people. We have open houses in the lab once a month where we allow the public and other people to come in. We have patients, providers, everyone there. Um, we run other workshops. We're constantly um, approached by different organizations and just that idea of always being kind of open to, uh, to collaborating with other people because I think um, design is inherently a collaborative process and I think the more minds involved, the better. So if you want to get involved in design and you don't have a lot of resources, certainly, you know, use the resources that you have, um, but then don't be afraid to just start designing on your own. Pick any problem and then go through the steps of design and, um, and really see that with you know, some post-it notes and some tape. And we do, um, you know, small prototyping sessions in our lab and we'll restrict ourselves, you know, to three things. You have three things that you can prototype with. And um, I think just letting people know that um, it's more of the idea and the spirit of wanting to be involved in these health problems. And the medical knowledge, yes, is important for some very specific devices, but um, you know, you can have a lot of great creative ideas that can really change the game later for some of those devices just by some really simple prototypes. And then the last question, since you have some background in emergency medicine, and that's actually one of the personas that's at the crux of the osteoporosis challenge, um, any insights on how um, to design for emergency medicine professionals or, or insights into that experience, um, anything to keep in mind while we're thinking about helping those folks um, in, in supporting health? Yeah, so I guess what I would say is definitely um, encourage um, the, the patients and the providers you talk to to share their story and their information because as a, a provider, often in the emergency department, things happen quickly and there's a lot of competing. There's you know 22 patients at a time and lots of things going on. And, and so you don't wanna miss critical information. And so the more um, patients are willing to share their story. So don't be afraid to say um, to a provider like, hey, I, you know, I have osteoporosis because for me now that's gonna trigger something. Oh my gosh, now I know why this fracture occurred because I may see something clinically and think, well, that's an odd fracture to have for that. But if I don't know that a person has that medical condition, I might not be thinking about it um, specifically for that person. Um, so as, uh, as groups are going through this, and I think as you're designing, figuring out ways to increase communication is always key. Um, so any way that you can increase the communication of someone's health uh, 
maladies or, or illnesses to a provider, I think is really, um, is really helpful in the process. So keeping that communication open and then um, starting to think about, you know, what other, other ways are there to, to um, get providers to think about this more um, as a, uh, as really a, 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 big, a big problem, right? Um, this is something, as you pointed out on your slides earlier, that affects lots of people, but sometimes it's just not, you know, a lot of times osteoporosis is thought of as a chronic disease. And so we wanna find ways to get to, um, you know, really to get medical providers to be thinking, wait a minute, it's a chronic disease, but it has an acute intervention. And we have this, this visit now to do something about this. And like you're saying, prevent um, a possible, you know, make that first fracture their last fracture. Love that. It's a great way to wrap. Thank you so much, Christy, um, for joining us. This is amazing to have you on here. Um, and for everyone else, um, we really, really hope that you enjoyed what you learned here and that you join us on openideo.com to participate in the challenge, no matter how early stage your idea is. Um, and then be sure to, to follow um, the Health Design Lab's work online and with that upcoming book. Um, we also have office hours. There's so many questions in here that we wanted to get to, um, but we have office hours on Wednesday mornings and um, can talk a lot more about sort of the design piece. And we also have innovation coaches. Ashley wanted me to remind you. Um, so those are on the platform. Once you submit your idea, we're able to um, really provide some support there as well. Um, but yes, great. Thanks so much again. Um, and we are grateful for your time and hope to see you online. <laughs>